Hello, hello. It's Thursday, 4.20 p.m. Eastern. That means it's time for Office Hours, Arroyo's weekly session for cultivators to hear from the experts and talk to each other about what they're seeing with their grows. My name is Mandy, and I'll be covering for our lovely Keisha today. She's representing Arroyo out at MJ Unpacked. So if you're out at Vegas at that event, be sure you connect with her. We're also going to be out, out at a couple of conventions coming up, like Hall of Flowers and MJ BizCon. It's super exciting to be a part of such an industry that's growing so fast. Um, so today, we're actually here for episode 40. So we're over live on YouTube. So make sure you post your questions for me, and I'll make sure I get those to the guys. If you're live with us here and you have a question, you can type it in the chat at any time. If we do choose you, you can go ahead and, and ask your question, or I can ask it for you. Um, but today we're here with Seth and Jason live and on the air. Hey, what's up guys? Hey, hey, Mandy. Hey, good to see you. How's your week going? Good. Yeah. It's uh, it's pretty nice outside here. We finally got a little rain. Nice. All right. A little turn of the seasons, uh, mm-hmm. happening mm-hmm. soon over there. That's awesome. Love to hear about it. Uh, getting some more people joining us. Welcome. Welcome. Hi, Laura. Well, um, yeah, uh, we had a couple of questions come in over the week and we had a bunch uh, from Instagram last week. So uh, you guys have any other messages before we just jump right into the crop steering questions? Let's get started. Yeah. I love I love the game faces. Let's go, you guys. Um, All right. Uh, Our first question came in from Rich over on Instagram. Uh, This week he wrote, I'm looking into getting a tent to store my mom's. I also plan to use it for root cuttings and to veg out. Do you have any advice before I get started? Uh, make sure you've got some airflow in the tent is definitely one of the starting places. Uh, make sure your lights aren't overheating the tent. So sometimes, you know, just a good exhaust fan as well as um, an air exchange fan, uh, either or mixing fans in there. That's probably going to be the number one things. Um, other than that, it's just like having a little sealed tilt room for that stuff and it's a great idea to kind of keep contamination down from uh from your mom's your little cuttings yeah and uh you know just remember like if you're vegging plants in there you don't have any separation between your mom's your cuttings and your veg so um if for instance your mom's get any kind of pest in them you're gonna have some problems with your clones and your veg too so in an ideal world you might want three tents for that kind of purpose Uh, and then the other thing is just uh i was like to remind people you know as far as contamination goes, never go backwards in the life cycle. So if you go in and water your moms and check your clones and do your veg watering in the morning, don't go back in there after you check your flower room. You know, simple protocols to help keep your place clean go a lot farther than trying to spend a lot of money on technology to do that. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, we had another question come in uh, from our friends over at River City Growers. Uh, they want to know, Aqualab aside... What's your favorite method for measuring dried or cured finished product? Uh, Aqualab. <laughs> well, when measuring it, I like to use a scale <laughs> personally. Um, aside from that, I mean, you can really get pretty scientific and try to dry it down to almost absolute zero weigh the difference. Uh, that's going to be pretty destructive <laughs> on your, your product though. So outside of Aqualab, the snap and the smoke test, I guess, is what I always went with. Yeah, and I mean, I hate to mention it, but some people have used wood moisture sensors. I, I mean, an application that's probably better than not doing anything at all. Um, I don't know how many steps better it is, but uh, but yeah, my, my favorite and probably just because I have good access to it is an Aqualab. Um, if you are processing lots of product, then it's definitely a, a good route to go to ensure that you're, you're not losing, you know, 1%, 2% over thousands of pounds of product. Uh, and another thing that I always really liked about it that has been a big selling point is the fact that quite a few of your um, labs that do your COAs are using an aqua lab. So if you use that aqua lab, you know that your product should get the same results by the time it gets to them. If it doesn't, you know, just make sure that, uh, that the packaging going out the door to get COAs is, is good to keep that product fresh. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I just, I just want to touch on that too and just say, you know, uh, there's quite a few people I work with that haven't, you know, they haven't taken that step to the aqua, the aqua lab yet. That's an eventual scale out plan. One thing that has really helped them though is getting as much monitoring equipment as they can afford into their dry room 
and then investing in their dehumidification capability and the rest of their HVAC to make sure that their dry room is consistent. So even outside of water activity, one place a lot of people are starting when chasing that is uh, how well is my dry room controlled? Are we, you know, looking at seasonal fluctuations that we have to deal with? We don't have it sealed off well enough from the outside. Um, that, that is just a big thing too. getting your processes refined so that if you can hit the point where you're confident that your quality is very, very close without equipment, you're at least having consistency in your process. And that's even with the equipment, that's what we're going to be refining. Right. So look at it at all angles. It's not just having an aqua lab or a moisture content meter. It's also saying, okay, can I, can I handle those first few days when the plants are really wet and we're drying down? And can I do that without drying it down too fast? And creating kind of a hard outer crust. So, you know, just uh, focus on as much data as you can and then attacking the problems you can see before assuming that you need to always spend as much money as you can. And get. you don't always need the most expensive tool to view the problem. You might need it to really, really define it and really get down to it. But um, you can do a lot without it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, actually just earlier this week, I was working with a guy refining some HVAC systems at a place and he was very thankful for uh, absolute humidity reading that we have in the Aurora system. And if you're trying to spec out how much more dehumidification capacity you need, uh, absolute humidity is a fantastic tool for understanding the capacity of new dehumes. Yeah. We can actually figure out how many pints we need. Although then you're going to wish everything was rated in a metric after that. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, we had a question come in over uh let's see on Instagram today too. Um B Ski Genetics wants to know I'm only running four lights, but looking to maximize my yields with my space. Um, I'm excited to introduce the Taros 12 uh into my next run. Is there anything on our website where I can get a guide or how to feed and what to look for uh to steer either way? I don't know if we specifically have that. I know in our user manuals and our onboarding guides for uh, Aurora clients, we mm -hmm. do provide kind of an outline there. Um, if you know you want some some somewhere to start that explains that kind of thing, so you could check out like um, one of the Floriflex expert uh, Instagram sites. Maybe download some Grodan white papers. Uh, those are the places that I would start for online resources. Yeah, I'll definitely kind of expand it. So Floriflex tech support is actually like, that's kind of one of the lead ones. Um, they've got a lot of great guides on how to do it without necessarily having access to the equipment. One thing you do need to understand though, is uh, there's certain limitations without having that monitoring equipment. So like with the Terrace, with just the Terrace 12 and the Solus application, you can have some pretty decent success with success with that small room. So long as you can really nail down that consistency in there. And then, you know, the next le level is like, okay, how often are you there to take those readings? Um, if you can get a reading every hour, we're going to have a lot greater control than if you can get a reading twice a day, for instance. So you can accomplish qu quite a lot. Um, yeah. And, you know, just kind of look out there. There's, there's a lot of good information and, uh, you know, a lot of it comes from sources you, you might not expect, like the Groden white papers are a great resource. You can go to their website, sign up read about crop steering in other crops and start to learn some of the fundamentals behind, you know, what does this irrigation strategy do to plants? And then, you know, the more you understand about that, and if you're very passionate about the cannabis plant and our different phases of growth, you can kind of start to put together, okay, here's why we are steering generatively during this time period stretch. Here's why we're bulking when we're bulking. And here's why we're ripening when we're ripening. Yeah. You know, if you plan to, uh, you know, get bigger than that at some point, you know, be running a production facility or, you know, hundred lights or something like that size, then I definitely like the university, um, extensions as well. Many of them have greenhouse manuals that they provide to their students, uh, that are enrolled in those programs, download them and, you know, start to just dive into the science behind cultivation. I found that really helped me out when I began cultivating. Yeah. You know, if you, you can read a, a set of irrigation instructions over and over and over. And if you aren't looking at what kind of physiological changes and morphological changes we're producing with the plant, then, um, you're, you're kind of just waiting to see what happens. Right. You know, it's, it's kind of in it. And when you're in business trial and error experimentation is really, really expensive. We all know that I will add to that though. If you are, you know, 
working off of a caregiver model or some legal cultivation, definitely hit up our sales there. You might be surprised with some of the people we're able to help out as long as they uh, have the proper licensing in their area. Great. So there's a couple of different ways you can approach looking for resources, but it's all about kind of having an understanding of horticulture. Uh, yeah. And the science behind it. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. Thank you guys for that. We did have a question come in over on YouTube. Gabe wants to know, will the open sprinkler integration be able to operate through Zintra as well? No, not no, no current plans for that. Um, yep. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you guys for that. Uh, we had some more come in on Instagram. Um, okay. So we had a user ask about different viroids, um, the infectious uh, uh, entities that affects plants. Um, they're asking about, do we know all of all 15 of them um, that typically affect cannabis plants? Do you guys want to talk about some of them? Some of the most uh, detrimental ones that you guys have seen? Um, yeah. I mean, so probably way more than any other thyroid that we hear about top late and, and, uh, you know, over the last few years, it's definitely been fairly destructive on some crops. Uh, the fact that it's, you know, it does take a lab to verify that it is hop latin. Uh, typically you'll see some plants being dudded and not all plants are symptomatic, even if they are infected. And so it's, it's a tough one. Definitely worth, uh, worth getting your mom's tested before you make large number of cuts and being very diligent with cleaning, uh, your cutting tools. Yeah. You know, uh, full for foreclosure. I'm not a certified or licensed or <laughs> I have some plant pathology education, but I can't rattle off 15 viroids for you off the top of my head. Um, at the end of the day though, when we're talking about production systems, you know, we, we have a certain limit to how we can treat different things, right? Like if you've got hop latent, what are we looking at doing? Well, hopefully putting something into tissue culture and completely nuking the facility. So at the end of the day, you got to look at, okay, how much is it to, uh, you know, combat this virus, this virus. And what does it take? Well, at the end of the day, it takes cleaning out the facility. It also takes that tissue culture cleanup, which <clears throat> is difficult cost and time consuming. Uh, can it be worth it? Absolutely. But then going on from that, you know, the more important thing with viroids is to look back and say, okay, where did it come from? How did I get it? You know, I mean, but before we started to see hops late, you know, one of the bigger ones was bringing in uh, mites or root aphids or, you know, all the results of bringing in a potted teen into your facility from another facility. Well, the same is true with the virus. And at the end of the day, we can explore each of those viroids, but you know, cleanliness and avoiding exposure is really the only way to keep them out of your facility. Good notes for people out there who are looking to avoid those. Um, we had a bunch of questions coming over on YouTube in just a minute. Um, so Jason wants to know, ha, huh, another Jason out there. Uh, hey, Arroyo team, I'm the DC for a licensed producer in South Africa. I was wondering if you have any thoughts on pollination prevention and high temp in greenhouses and how can I get Arroyo hardware? Uh, yeah, let's start off with the Arroyo hardware. I'm not positive we can sell in South Africa right now. I think I'd, I'd have to check with our team and some of the um, licensing on our radio for those devices. We'd love to get you some systems. Um, so you know, call our sales team and or I can check on uh, check on if that's an area we can sell to. As far as reducing pollination, um, we'll start off with that one. We'll talk about high temps, ways to combat that in a greenhouse. So my favorite way of... Um, Avoiding pollination is pressure uh, positive greenhouses. So in a lot of greenhouses that we see traditionally older school designs, they will have exhaust fans. So this is going to create a negative pressure box. That's what's pulling the air through the, the intake. Uh, a lot of times that's a pad. Um, and so if we actually run pressurizing fans, then we're not creating a vacuum. So any of the leaks in our greenhouse, if we are uh, negative pressure, they're going to pull in things like pollen, pests, uh, you know, dust, any of that type of stuff. And uh, a lot of the newer greenhouses, especially high tech ones, we're running positive pressure in there. Um, so that's my favorite way of avoiding pollination. What, what are your thoughts there? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I completely agree. Treat your greenhouse like a flow hood. 
you know, uh, pollen can't move upstream in airflow. So if we have airflow pressurizing the greenhouse, we're also not only, you know, pushing air out of, you know, the bigger orifices, our vents and everything, but even the small parts that are really difficult to seal up. And that can not only help with pollen, but things like thrips and mites and other stuff that's trying to crawl in from the outside, you know, and then the other side of that, I think is, uh, starting to identify, you know, uh, where do your pollination problems come from? Are you within a mile of a, a traditional hops field? Are you really close to a bunch of outdoor grows? In my experience, uh, and, and maybe this is personal, you know, I found that when I had pollination issues in the greenhouse, usually that was from herming plants. And unfortunately, I would find that if I was growing, say, seven different strains in there, some of them might, you know, throw, uh, throw any kind of hermaphroditic trait stamens at uh, different times. So I might have some that like to do it early. So then, all right, well, I'm seeing some pollination in some part of the greenhouse around week five, but then I've got other ones that drop at week seven. And then I don't really see like full seed formation. I see little seedlets that are, you know, don't even have a developed embryo in them yet. So really look around and see, you know, is it outside or is it happening inside? And especially sometimes when it happens early and without a lot of prevalence with those herming plants, we can see a lot of seeds deep inside the bud <clears throat> that get set before we enter bulking. So really, I mean, yeah, there's some good tips to avoid it. One of the better ones though, is really trying to figure out exactly the source of that pollen. You know, it's kind of like we talk about hops late and just recently. Well, if you can guess, it came from hops because here in the Northwest, we have a few regions that are uh, really good for growing hops and happen to have a lot of people that want to grow cannabis there. So you add in, you know, the recent push over the last decade to uh, establish hemp agriculture. And we have a few lo locations in the Northwest that are just a perfect environment for that. And then add uh, breeding and the traffic of clones and the lack of certification regulation for the clone industry right now. And uh, now you, you kind of get to where we're at. So always try to find the base of your problems. Yeah. And I think we can lead into his next question here is um, obviously to help reduce any hermaphroditic traits, you can decrease some of the, the stressor points um, or beyond stressor points of your plants. So one of those would be heat in, uh, in a greenhouse. And I'd imagine down over in, in South Africa, that is a real concern. Uh, a lot of, a lot of portions of the year. So, uh, couple of ways to, to deal with that. And we'll probably just talk about the, you know, the typical, um, equipment ways, uh, cable vents. If you've got, mm -hmm. uh, roofs that can pop open, that's going to naturally allow the hot air that's rising to escape. So rather than just being a, a vertically, uh, exhausted greenhouse or a vertically, uh, or excuse me, horizontally exhausted greenhouse or horizontally, uh, pressurized greenhouse, you can run those, those roof vents. Uh, if you are positive pressurized, which is awesome. Typically you'll see less gradient um, from front to back of the greenhouse. You may not even have a front or the back of the greenhouse like you would with a, a horizontally exhausted greenhouse. Um, so make sure that you've got nice cold water in your pad pumps. Uh, mm -hmm. If you've got well water, that's ideal. Um, one of the things that I did try when we got, we got beyond our cooling capacity was actually put nice in the pad pump and that made a pretty significant difference on a day-to-day -day basis, not probably what you want to do, but you know, if you run into <laughs> <Not> practical <laughs> to two or three days in a row that are, are way beyond what you can handle, give it a shot. Um, even getting a water chill in there, in there can help yep. a lot, honestly, especially if you've got a good return rate, you're not evaporating too much. Um, but like you said though, water quality is key If we're pushing a lot of hard water through our pad vent. That means we're gonna have to clean it a lot. And, uh, also from personal experience, if you do have hard water, don't turn off your pad vent through that run. <laughs> all that scale is going to shoot out of the pad vent all over your crop. Um, blackout. Uh, I, when I did programming on, uh, some, uh, local greenhouses, we, I would basically have a high heat setting. So mm -hmm. it was it threw a flag. And when I got, you know, 15 degrees over my set point, I would basically go into an emergency heat standpoint. Um, and what I'd do is end up closing the blackout a certain amount. Right. And so, uh, sure. I'm jeopardizing some of that free light that I could be getting, but when my heat's going that far up at that point, I'm just trying to, to salvage plant health. And so I, you know, I'd close it like 25% if I was 15 degrees above set point, uh, go to 50% if I was 20 degrees over set point or, or all the way. Um, those are, probably aren't the exact numbers that I used, but just trying to evaluate, Hey, how much can I sacrifice in order to, to keep that temperature down? Um, and obviously a, a lot of good blackouts are, are silver on the top side. 
and they'll help just reflect any of that that solar radiation coming through. If you do have uh, the roof vents, you know, and uh, a reflective blackout, it's going to play a huge factor in, in keeping the, the lower portions of it cool. Um, if you have hydronic bench heaters, a lot of times you can actually run that cool water through the hydronic system and keep your root zone even cooler as well. And that, that can play a pretty big factor, especially if you can't keep the air temperature down. Yeah. You know, and, uh, one thing I always find myself reminding cannabis growers about is especially when you get in the greenhouse utilize, I mean, we always talk about plant empowerment as being a good resource. Uh, there's several other resources about greenhouse growing and, uh, well, I mean, there's a whole series of textbooks, <laughs> not not one series, but several that have been written over the years that talk about how we can calculate airflow needs, humidity needs and how, you know, greenhouse design. So it doesn't matter what we're growing in the greenhouse. If we have X amount of humidity and X amount of heat to get rid of, those are calculatable things, especially when we know some of the environmental conditions. So if you look into that a little further, you can really start to analyze for yourself like, hey, here's my here's what I'm stuck with now i'm seeing way too high v- bpd way too high heat based on these changes i want to make which one might be the most effective based on movement of btus based on you know gaining or losing humidity in there what do we want to achieve and that's probably the best way to go about it to be honest just try to learn as much as you can about greenhouse design that way you're not throwing money at a problem that you don't have quantified you don't know how much money it's going to take start there and then go forward, you know? And then the other thing too, um, it's going to sound low tech, but Hey, if your heat is way up and you just can't keep your VPD under control, uh, we're, we're just joking about this before the show, actually (laughs) sounds low tech, get out there at the hose and hose down the floor. You know, if you got a big concrete pad in there, get it wet a few times a day. Um, unfortunately to keep your VPD in check at 90, 95 degrees, we need like 80% humidity. So, you know, just follow your VPD chart and start to make decisions based on that. Wow. Thank you guys. That was super um, educational. Um, We had about five questions come in in that time. So, and a couple of shout outs. Uh, Mista says, thanks for the reply. We'll be in contact for sure. Um, We have a question from Grateful. Have you ever seen or used scales under rock wool to determine dry back percentage and shot scheduling? Uh, Sure. So let's talk about load cells a little bit. Uh, in Dodge greenhouses, you'll see them all over the place. Uh, people that are running, you know, the high high bay greenhouses doing uh, cucumbers, peppers, tomatoes. They, you know, they'll be running fifteen foot high plants. They'll be running the entire bench on load cells to evaluate water usage. So, uh, you know, on a really large scale, that load cells are a great way to do it. Um, when we go to evaluate. Uh, our sensors or do new sensor design we're always uh, cross-referencing it with with the scale uh, in order to to get those those dry downs and stuff so um in yeah in application it's fantastic when it comes down to deploying those type of sensors it can be a little bit trickier uh, obviously the cost of doing a, a load cell setup in a greenhouse is uh it's pretty tough. Uh, there's, it's, it's a lot of money that's going into there. And if you're looking to retrofit on almost never pays off. And that's where we see the effectiveness of a wireless sensor, like the Taros 12 is anybody can get that purchased. You know, if they're in a 5,000 square foot greenhouse or indoor, if they're in a hundred thousand square foot, they can have that system up in a day without any engineering, uh, you know, any saws, any, uh, any, construction workers, uh, revamp in that place. So if you've, if you've got them, absolutely take advantage of them. Um, you know, as far as the principles go pretty much the same is you know, evaluating water content. Uh, you know, another advantage that terrace twelves do have is you get temperature and uh, electrical connectivity in, in those substrates. Mm-hmm. So that was obviously you'd have to evaluate somehow else, uh, if you are using load cells. Yeah. And, you know, that I think you nailed it there. It's really an implementation uh, problem that using wireless wireless technology overcomes here. You know, if how many load cells would you need out there? If you had one per hundred square foot, that would be so many load cells in a given facility and the cost is going to be so much greater. But currently right now where they come in handy, honestly, is cloning. So weigh your dry rock wool slab, wet it up, weigh it. And then now, you know, every gram is a milliliter of water. We can figure out how much water those clones are pulling out. We can watch them getting lighter. We can watch them not getting lighter. Um, That's that's kind of at this point where scales and load cells come in. 
the other thing is, uh, you know, over the years looking at it, if we, we've got to correct our measurement on the load cell because we're building weight in the plant above it. So at the end of the day, it is a really cool measurement, but all we can really look at is, uh, the difference between right after we water and then later in the day and always know that we have a little bit of inaccuracy because we have a changing by the minute weight above the pot. Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to mention as well as, uh, it, you know, the high tech growers that have used them in traditional horticulture, they have biomass accumulation models, um, in which mm -hmm. that they're using to offset that load cell, uh, unless you really want to dig into the science of it and you know, your how fast your plants grow, uh, as far as the, their carbon buildup, then it's going to be quite a bit of work to get there. If you're running a new genetic, uh, you know, when, when you're deleafing, these are all, uh, weight attributes that are going to adjust the, the load cell. And, and you're going to have to account for those when you're using it for water content, if you want accuracy. Yeah. And, and I mean, a, a way I like to look at it too, is, uh, you know, using the load cells can kind of go back. You could compare it to Triton to, uh, calculate total transpiration across the greenhouse based on, you know, leaf surface VPD and approximate leaf area index. Well, I know my leaf area index is going to be a very, very rough estimation. Uh, in fact, I'd just say it's a guesstimation because it's going to be wildly inaccurate. So I know if I'm calculating uh, transpiration rates and water usage that way, I'm going to be looking at pretty wide averages and something that's very approximate. And that's kind of the same way we look at that load cell, unless you spend the time and money to take it to that next level. And right now, most uh, cannabis producers are too busy trying to make money. I, I will say your, your time is better spent building your business and making sure it's going to be there next year and the year after than it is pursuing um, expensive research in your little facility, in your not little, but any particular facility right now. It's, it's just expensive. You know, don't don't take chances unless you're willing to throw your weed away. That's kind of the way to look at it. When you put it that way, it's an easy decision. Uh, thank you guys for those questions that are coming in over on YouTube. We did have a couple more. Um, John wants to know, my new stock is in pure cocoa. This next run, as per your advice, since there's a ready to roll, uh, you said recently it takes longer for full spectrum LED to ripen. Uh, can you give me like a ballpark? Um, not, not confidently without knowing genetics and, um, environment and light intensity at that canopy. Um, I, you know, maybe if, you know, you're ripening over seven days, you might see 10 to 12 days of ripening, but it's going to be quite genetic dependent. Um, you know, when we look at that, that spectrum change, it's, it's affecting different, um, different chemicals in there, right? So when we look at phytochromes, cryptochromes, um, those are secondary metabolites and the, um, concentration of those is, is widely different from cultivar to cultivar. Uh, and typically those are the ones that are, are modifying how quickly we ripen up. Yep. And I, I wish I'd prepared some push pictures for this question. Um, I have seen many, many examples of growers that have both HID and LED rooms. Typically they're running a little bit longer, sometimes in that four to five day range. Some strains I actually get quicker under their LEDs with full spectrum. Um, like Jason said, it's genetically, it's really hard to make that or tell you for what you're growing, what's going to happen. Um, but back to the pictures, uh, just because of the spectrum and type of radiation that's hitting those buds and that plant in general throughout its life, a lot of plants will look morphologically different under an LED versus an, H an HPS. So like, and what I mean by that is when we look up, the LED might just have a little bit different shape. We might have a taller bud with the HID and a shorter, fatter bud with the LED. We might have a little slightly different color. We might have a little darker green with the HID versus the LED or vice versa. So there's a lot of little differences to look at. And then even when we get into the world of LEDs, you know, do we have a uh, far red supplementation? Do we have UV supplementation? There's a lot of factors in that spectrum that are going to influence that. And this, this is a really fun area of study uh, yeah. for me because uh, traditional in horticulture, there hasn't been a ton of energy spent in um, the sciences of uh, was photomorphogenesis. Uh, and that would be talking about how uh, plants physiology changes over time in respect to uh the light mm -hmm. and that can be light intensity it could be intensity combined with spectrum as well so really neat things that we're seeing uh, especially moving to leds and we see some led manufacturers doing uh, 
adjustable spectrum in their LEDs as well. So if you are using adjustable spectrum, probably good to start doing some A-B testing on rooms and, you know, playing with the the blues maybe earlier on and then playing with some, some infrared to see if you can't uh, trim down your ripe time. Yeah. And then make sure, you know, I mean, back to any kind of experimentation, make sure you document it properly. You know, if you're going to be playing with that document, every change you've made at every time. And then also, you know, we're talking about the effects of light spectrum on plants. Go back to it. We've got to look at that holistic run. So if I just change the spectrum for two weeks in the middle of the run, and I want to call that a difference or one week or two days, I really need an extended period of time for that to actually morphologically change the plant. Awesome. All super important things to keep in mind. Um, John, I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Uh, follow up with any other questions you have. Uh, just for style, Santana uh, asks, what pH ranges uh, have you guys found most successful in rock wool? 5.6. Yeah. 5.6, 5.7, 5.8, 5.9. Usually right at 5.6 going in though, because you don't have quite as much variability as you would say cocoa. Yeah, I'll, I'll add one caveat on that. When we are wetting up uh, a rock wool that has uh, a surfactant in it, a wetting agent, then sometimes we'll actually want to go just slightly lower because typically those surfactants are uh, more basic. And so if I'm wetting up uh, rock wool for the first time, a lot of times I'll go in at like 5.4 uh, just to make sure that I am dissolving the um, that wetting agent out of the product. And then I'll be at that that standard five, six, five, seven after the, the wash up. Yeah. You know, a good rule of thumb for uh, rock wool or cocoa is uh VDC feed pH. That's what we're typically going in at. And then if we test runoff, test the plant, like cocoa, for instance, if we've got something that's super salty, <laughs> well, you might want to rinse it out a few times per the instructions, test it to make sure it's good. And uh, yeah, at the end of the day, I think best practice is always when you've got either an old or new media, wet it up with the solution you're going to use, test it, make sure it's sitting where you want it to sit, try to get a little runoff, make sure you don't have uh, anything that you don't want to be planting in. You know, that's just best safety practice for your plants. Awesome. Thanks guys. Um, Laura had a question. Uh, Laura, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Hey guys, I'm just curious to know what exactly cocoa is made out of. Cocoa courier. Uh, is made out of coconut husk and it is crushed and shredded and then it's washed and dried and sometimes it's compressed into blocks so that it stores and ships well yeah it's a it's actually a byproduct of the uh, general coconut industry that has been around ever since uh, they started stripping coconuts canning them and sending them over and sending them overseas so pretty neat awesome that is super neat thanks thank you <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, learning, learning things every day. Um, back to some of our Instagram questions. Cause we have a ton, uh, this is a little bit longer, so bear with me. Uh, what's the easiest way to raise your substrate EC while generative steering? So I use smaller shot sizes. Uh, uh, so do I use smaller shot sizes or do I lower the frequency of irrigation events during my P1? I'm currently doing 10, 4% shots until I hit max saturation. And then sometimes I'll add a couple of maintenance shots. So I don't dry back too hard. I'm using six inch Hugo blocks. It's been difficult to get my EC up past two, uh, yeah, 2.0. Uh, I'm also wondering if my sensors aren't working properly. Um, it's another system that I won't mention here. <laughs> So, so, um, yeah, we, we won't mention that part either. Uh, oh, I don't think we have to discredit them with this one though. <laughs> so uh, a couple of things, I mean, the easiest answer, if everything else was right in, in track, then reducing runoff would be, that's, mm -hmm. that's the easy answer. A couple things going on here though. So we're really glad that you included the details. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're running in a six by six Hugo and you have to do the maintenance shots, um, then it's going to be tricky to do some of that, you know, reducing runoff and, and keeping your EC stacking. Uh, so if your plants are big enough, you might just consider going in a little bit larger your media, uh, you know, possibly into some slabs and, uh, and or run like an eight by eight. If you don't like slabs for some reason, I mm -hmm. personally love slabs. Um, yeah. So those, I guess those would be kind of the, the more advanced solutions to it. And then also look at your feed EC. If you're feeding too low, those plants are going to be eating up the nutrients and they won't stack up 
right? And so, uh, you know, if, if you're going in anywhere under say two and a half with a two part salt, then you're probably just running out of nutrients and that's why it's not building up. Yeah. And you know, I mean, a, one really important factor when you're trying to dial all this in, especially these shots and look at like, okay, how much, how much runoff can I push and look at, you know, what my EC is doing after that. Uh, right now it sounds like there's a good chance that a lot of the time, especially with the maintenance shot, shots, like Jason mentioned, you're just washing back to your feed EC basically. And another thing to consider too, is, uh, if you are trying to stack it up, you're, you can't keep up with it. We didn't come out of veg with a high enough EC. Sometimes we got to up that feed EC, you know, upping from a 2.5 to 3.0 is a good place to start. If uh, that's where you're at, which is where, you know, the highest, a lot of traditional mixes will come in. Um, even going up to a 3.5 or a four sometimes is necessary if we've got a plant that just cannot stack EC, but we always want to balance that. We always need some runoff. So yeah, modulating runoff is typically the way we we stack EC on the Aurora program. Great. Thanks for that advice. Um, Jason also over on YouTube has another question. Uh, what's your strategy for plant dry uh, for plant not drying evenly in our greenhouses? Um, over fertigate the slow feeders or underwater the strong plant, the stronger plants. Thanks for any information you have. Uh, process review and understand what's resulting in those inconsistencies is where, where I like to go with it. Um, obviously prevention is ideal. So if there's places in your cutting processes that you think you can improve, if you need to tear out your drip emitters because they're clogged, um, and not run any, um, any talc based additives in the future, uh, those, those are definitely things, you know, making sure you got enough pressure so that those PCMs are operating uh, appropriately across all of the the plants. So in my, my first step personally would be just to review w- why we're running into those inconsistencies. Um, and then obviously if I had any energy left over from that, maybe I would, I would try to compensate with, with what we're dealing with right now. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, a few things there, you know, number one, we got to go find those, or we got to establish, do we have a microclimate problem in, in this facility or do we have a, uh, irrigation problem. So number one, if we've established that the irrigation works, it's consistent. All right. You know, number two processes. All right. We, you know, how are the plants coming out of veg? Do we actually have consistency? But you did say one thing that tipped me off, which is greenhouse. Now, a lot of cannabis greenhouse houses that I've seen, you know, some of them are changing that, but typically have a longitudinal airflow, which means we have a pretty big gradient from where the air enters the room and where it exits. Uh, the other side of this is the trend in horticulture in general, especially pre-cannabis, which is carried into cannabis, is to install your benches parallel to that longitudinal flow rather than perpendicular. And what that means is now we have irrigation zones that are running a longitudinal differential across them. So we have a zone where one end is drying out faster than the other effectively. Uh, It doesn't sound exciting, but sometimes in those situations, uh, you know, ideally we'd reorganize the room. So our zoning was correct. Well, sometimes we've already invested all this money into this bench layout and stuff. What's the next option? More zones. Buy more solenoids, zone it off so you can, uh, you know, be more precise with your irrigation application and treat those parts of the room that you know you're having problems with. Uh, But it it really all starts, like Jason said, foundationally. Look at your processes, look at your greenhouse and actually uh, isolate that problem. Because again, if we have a big differential and we put in the most consistent crop, but it's all in one irrigation zone, then our, our ability to, uh, treat any one plan is kind of out the window. Yeah. I, um, I did a video just on kind of the statistical basis of population data. And so go check it out on our YouTube channel. I think it's called uh, growth behavior or something like that. And, um, it might give you a couple ideas on how to identify those issues. So obviously if you do see a very clear gradient, like Seth's talking about, it is probably climate related. If the consistency is spotty based, then it's probably more likely irrigation or um, plant consistency based. Yep. That's a good point. And then we're looking at that too, you know, remember we're always, we don't have a sensor on every plant. We don't have a valve for every plant. So at the end of the day, we're always playing a game of averages and working on a range for every every parameter we're looking at. The best we can do is try to equip ourselves so we can make that range narrower and narrower. Awesome. Thanks guys. Um, moving on down our list from our questions from Instagram this past week. Um, 
NRY Garden is asking, um, I'm looking for some guidance on target EC uh, in the first 20 in the first 21 days of bloom and uh, target EC uh, 21 days until the end of flower. Do you guys have any advice? What's your EC coming out of veg? That's, that's where we'll start. EC is a very, uh, it's not a static range or number. It's a dynamic value that uh, if we're going to approach what's optimal, it's not even for each strain. We're going down to, you know, each facility. Do you have HID? Do you have LED? And then run to run. How consistent have you been? Where did you come out of veg at? And what can we expect to stack up to at these plants? So some plants, if we come out of veg at 1.5 or 2, once we put those into stretch, I can guarantee you most plants aren't going to stack up very well feeding at a 2.5 or a 3.0 because they're going to chomp through that salt faster and we can get it on there. Now, when that's the case, um, what am I looking to do? Am I looking to really jack up that EC right away? Not necessarily. I'm going to go look at plant health and say, okay, I might like to be in generative up in maybe this four to nine range. Uh, that's not going to happen this run. So what do I got to do? I've got to go back to managing plant health. And when we're talking about EC, the biggest thing to remember is that the plant can adapt to that EC only so fast. So during stretch, we're going to be building up ideally. But if we couldn't build up and stretch, now we're going to be running a little lower in bulking and a little lower in ripening. That's just how it works. So, I mean, I know it sounds weird that we're always hesitant to give exact numbers. And that's because uh, there aren't exact numbers. You know, I could, same thing, we were talking about the same strain under LED and HID. I can show you the same strain. The same guy grew one finishing out at, you know, over a 10 EC and then the other one trying to flush, trying to taper it down. And guess what? The bud does look a little different, but neither of them are bad and uh, neither of them have a heavy black ash or any problem like that. So uh, it really comes down to your trajectory and then how well you can uh, be consistent run to run to really dial that in. Yeah, and I think he's uh, he's one of our clients up there in Canada that's got an Arroyo system. So set your target ranges and alerts in your harvest groups, and uh, and then you know if, if you don't have time to be looking at the graph maybe you know, every single morning, then our system can kind of just help you keep in in those adjustment time frames when you need to make modifications to that EC that you want. Yeah, and typically, you know, I I actually don't recommend that people set alerts for their EC. Um, I always recommend you set an alert for your uh, water content. Your high EC spike is always going to correspond to an over drying event. And then at that point, we just got to look at how, well, did you dry it all the way down to wilting? How far did we go? And then evaluate the damage there. Thank you guys. Um, so one love rebel wrote in on Instagram crop steering in larger uh, pots, five gallons and up. Do you guys have any advice for me? Any general tips? Grow your plants outside. I you know, say big plants. It's all about pot to plant size proportion. And then also one thing to consider about those big plants. Um, hey, I, it's pretty cool to like veg indoors and in May put out a six foot plant into the ground that, you know, is going to get to be 14 feet tall. You know, uh, the danger, one of the dangers about that is we tend to see a lot higher rates of uh, root pathogen and infection in plants that are in a big pot for a longer amount of time, just because we can't get consistent oxygen penetration into that pot. So we end up with anaerobic pockets and depending on your environment, you could be exposed to fusarium or pythium or a number of other soil diseases that we don't want in there. So, uh, yeah, basic advice. If you want to do that, you're going big. And then, you know, I, all I can say is send me pictures down the line. <laughs> Go big or go home. That's what I'm going to say for this one. Um, awesome. King Green Beast wrote in too. Uh, why are people convinced that product comes out better when grown in cocoa instead of rock wool? Have you guys heard that? Yeah, uh, I'll touch on that for a second. Uh, because cocoa looks like dirt. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I will say there are some people out there that are running kind of a hybrid system where they are throwing a lot of different organic inputs and mixing up their own soilless mix with cocoa. So there may be certain additives that you can get in there that people are not able to add to the rock wool, but, um, man, I, I, I need to see some quantification because a lot of, I hear a lot of it, I hear is, uh, well, I just feel, and, you know, I, I personally don't think there's a whole lot of if I'm running the same nutrient line in rock wool or cocoa, 
as long as I'm running that. And as long as I don't abuse either of those plants and they come out fairly consistent in terms of the way I grew them, I probably, I would defy you to tell the difference. You know, we, we can go back to those old wine tasting things where they had the cheap wines unlabeled next to some expensive ones. And, you know, even some of the fine wine people couldn't tell the difference when uh, they framed it in the right way. <laughs> I mean, yeah, maybe it's better because rock or uh, cocoa is more eco-friendly than rock wool, you know, yeah. and that that's debatable too. When we talk about, you know, carbon footprint, yeah, shipping something across the ocean. Um, yeah. I, like I said, I personally think it comes down to, it looks like dirt and, uh, it, it has a different feel, you know, the, and then on the other, other hand too, um, you don't typically see many people, uh, running rock wool outside of a commercial application. Yes, it happens, but people at home tend to have a lot more, a lot better luck watering, uh, hand watering cocoa than rock wool. Just because if you miss a day with your rock wool, we all know that run screwed, or at least the yield on that run is. So the cocoa better results over time. Well, that kind of makes some sense there. Um, River City Growers also sent in another question. Uh, what would the recommended parameters be for drying and curing, like temperatures, times, uh, relative humidity? Do you guys have any advice for him? Kind of what I start off with without knowing anything else about uh, what's going in as far as you know product size or the goals of the facility, 60 to 60, 60, 60 for 10 days. Um, that's kind of just, just the starting point. So 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 60% humidity, 10 days. Um, obviously you, it's pretty tough to hit those exactly right. You know, the first few days, you're probably going to be pushing your HVAC as hard as you can to, to get close to 60. Um, but if without any other information, that's, that's kind of what I'd like. Yeah. I, that's, that's a very reasonable goal. Uh, they, my biggest thing to say there is again, the consistency, like Jason said, might be tough those first few days to establish that, but that's where, you know, dialing your HVAC comes in and saying, okay, we need X amount of extra DHU capacity for the first three days. And then we can back it off to maintain that 60 and 60. I think, uh, one of the worst things you can do is dry too fast, too quick and really kill some of your bud quality there because it's hard to, uh, it's hard to get that jar appeal back after we've really crunched up the outside of the nug, then thrown it in bins and tumbled it around. Um, I mean, hopefully we're not beating it up that much, but <laughs> Hey, it's reality. If we got 200 pounds of, of product to pull down from a dry room, uh, and if that product has been dried in a way that makes it fall apart, we're going to have problems. Right. So just, just that consistency and being patient. It's so important to be patient. Um, we had a couple more questions. It's that simple. 420 is asking when calculating 1% shot size for cocoa, do you use US gallon uh, four liter or nursery trade gallon three liter? I try to get the actual volume from the manufacturer. So if the manufacturer says a gallon pot, does it say four liter? Or does it say three liter? Or does it say 3.78 liter? So typically just try to get the actual value from the manufacturer and maybe look to where, where is your product made? If uh, we're talking about Canada or Europe, you know, when they say a one gal, it's going to be that four liters. If we're talking about the U S it's going to be 3.5 probably. And when in doubt, measure it yourself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's uh, there's no crime in that. Dump it out and measure it. All right. There we go. Um, anyone on the chat with us, please submit your questions. We are rounding out our hour with Seth and Jason. Um, we can go ahead and get your questions asked. Um, I had one more question from Instagram. Um, when, when you cannot get your VPD down at the beginning of flowering, uh, what do you do? What are some, uh, what are some tips you have for lowering VPD? Um, I mean, so usually, you know, temperature is probably, you're hitting the temperature that you want. So if your VPD is too high, it's usually because we're having a hard time getting enough humidity in the room. Uh, a lot of times you will see that early in flower mm -hmm. simply because your plants aren't large enough to transpire and, and add as much water to the or water vapor to the air as you will see later in flower. Uh, so increased humid humidification capacity would be probably the easiest step. Yeah. I mean, uh, for a lot of people I've talked to, it's come to that realization. They've hit a room size now where their small plants can't keep up and it's actually making that, that first time installing a humidification system, yeah. you know, uh, sometimes depending on your, your size of the volume of the space you're growing in before it wasn't an issue. And now it is, 
you know, and we see that a lot with people that move into like warehouse spaces with very tall ceilings, um, greenhouses particularly because you have a lot of radiant energy coming in and actually warming up the air compared to just having grow lights. So it's actually in the summer can be quite hard to maintain that humidity. So don't, don't be scared to either buy a humidifier or we'll go back to it. If you've got concrete floors in your greenhouse, low tech, spray some water on the floor if it's getting that bad. Yeah. And, you know, we were just kind of discussing like when, when you do run into those issues, if, if it's a one-off thing, you know, it, it's for, you know, two days of the cycle, then you may not need to justify, uh, some type of humidification system. Um, you know, if, if it's, it's just barely get something you know really cheap to, to get that humidification system. If it's mm-hmm. a significant impact, uh, it's happening every time through the cycles all year round, then, uh, then you're, you're way better financially ahead just to, to get something in there. Yeah. It, it all comes back to return on benefit, return on investment and cost benefit analysis. If we don't need this all the time, maybe we can't get around it, but when it's time for a serious infrastructure upgrade, uh, a lot of times it's a lot cheaper to take care of the problem rather than band-aid it for a long time over and over and throw that labor at it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting when we look at the, um, plant life cycle. So if we look at the room for improvement, um, it's the largest, the younger the plant is. So as our plant grows, our, uh, you know, impacts of making an improvement to that, that plant environment and irrigation decreases because that plant has less life left to, uh, basically grow off the improvements that we've made. So if we can keep things as, you know, as tight as possible early on, that's really going to pay off towards the end. Um, and vice versa, we have obviously a lot more plant value as the plant gets older. So if we can mm-hmm. build that value as fast as possible, then, uh, then we're making the right choices in the room. Yeah. And then, you know, taking, taking a second to think about what, uh, when you are making those choices, you know, price aside, Sometimes, obviously, there's an obvious winner when I'm looking at two products. So there's price versus quality or price versus one, on one product versus another. The other I can't afford. But you don't always want to go as cheap as possible. Anytime you're upgrading, always think for the future and say, okay, you know, if we're talking about dehu, it's the same thing as humidifiers. If I'm getting a dehumidifier and I need to double my capacity, I don't want one more. I probably want four more smaller ones just because now I have a greater degree of control. The same would be applied to your humidification system. All right, in this room, I'm starting to look at the room size and at the area of influence that one humidifier can have. And then also, how does it perform? How consistent is it inside that area of influence? Well, in reality, if my room's 2,000 square feet, instead of one or two big ones, I might want a system that has, you know, 12 or 15 different nozzles and access points that are more evenly distributing that humidity that's around the room. That way I'm not just accidentally blasting the front of one bench. Meanwhile, 10 feet back, it's perfect. And 20 feet past that, it's bad again. So, you know, just really uh, when you're doing that cost benefit analysis, try to think of every aspect of that improvement and that upgrade, not just only that Delta that we're calculating for. Great. Uh, we had a couple more questions come in over on YouTube. So I'm going to try to go through those real quickly. Um, Gabe wants to know, do you have any advice to avoid white mold buildup on top of Hugo's? Uh, I mean, you can always put a cap on them. Um, that's not my favorite thing to do. I typically the molds aren't going to affect the plant growth too much if it's on just the substrate itself. So I, I usually don't get so worried about it. Obviously it is unsightly and um, not the best thing in the world, but when we look at how much energy it is to combat versus how harmful mm-hmm. it is to our production, it's usually towards the bottom of the list on corrective actions that we need to be taking. Yeah. And you know, I mean, it's something to look at there. Uh, well, what is causing the mold? Typically what we'd see is a lot more algae. Um, do you have a root drench that you're doing that has an organic component that stays behind that the mold can grow on? What What's going on there? Um, typically that question comes a lot more from algae. Uh, and again, with the mold, probably what I would do afterwards is just start dissecting those blocks and saying, okay, like algae, we could pull apart a, a Hugo and I can start shaving it down and show you that the algae actually isn't competing with the plant for water or nutrients. And we can calculate that the uptake of that algae and it's the, the percentage you're losing in efficiency in your system is negligible. You're losing more to runoff than you are to algae. And then again, that's the reason to go in with the mold and dissect it. Is that actually like, do I have good roots? 
Do I have good root growth or is this mold happening because I have root rot in this top block and that, that dead organic material is actually what's feeding it. So look, it's, it's an indicator that you might want to look deeper at what's going on. <clears throat> but just like Jason said, once you've investigated the problem, I mean, I've even said this about fungus gnats a bunch of times, you know, and I do a lot still talking to cocoa growers, especially ones that want to run compost teas, you know, and then do a drench for fungus gnats. I'm going, okay, well quit chasing your tail here. You're spending money on the compost tea, then you're spending money on the drench and then you're putting more compost tea on and you're getting more gnats. And the reality is those comp those fungus gnats don't feed on your roots. They feed on the uh, fungus in your root zone. So where fungus gnats really do well is if you bring in organic soilless mix and you've got decomposing matter in there and you've got beneficial fungus in your soil, that's what those fungus gnats eat. So if you're just worried that you see a fungus gnat or a few around, yeah, you might want to put some sticky cards out, start evaluating, okay, how many am I catching inside of a certain time period? <laughs> At what point do I think there's so many fungus gnats in here, they're going to like stick to the buds and people will see them in the jar, like really identify, is it a problem that bothers you or is it a problem that actually affects quality and output? You know, and the same can go if you, uh, uh, here's a classic one, switching from generative to vegetative, wash my EC out ran too much runoff <laughs> that, that happens all the time okay try to build it back up a little bit but i got some burnt tips i got some yellow leaves because i was deficient for a few days while i was trying to get that back up the plant didn't like it well those leaves aren't going to turn back green so part of part of uh i guess being a grower is learning when you need to let th when you can let things bother you and when you need to put them down and say okay that does bother me but that is not a uh a factor I need to worry about for profitability in my system. Cause at the end of the day, if you're too worried about your garden, I mean, we all got to go home and sleep. We got to have a life outside the garden too. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think anyone's in this to have a bad time. Most, most cannabis growers are, I find to be fairly passionate and enjoy what they're doing. So I like to do my best to keep it that way for them. Uh, Thank you guys for that. They did have a follow-up. They don't have any organic inputs and they've never appeared on my plants. They're just unsightly. So yeah. it sounds like that's some good advice for them. You um, I'm going to go ahead. Sorry. You could use just a, you know, a small concentration of hyperchlorous acid in your feed as well. Um, you know, that's going to do two things to just help keep your lines clean and sanitized and uh, give a little bit more dissolved oxygen to that roots. That'll help prevent any um, anaerobic areas in the substrate. Yeah. And uh, to that point too, I do know a few growers who do a very light xerotol spray in their under canopy early on after they've cleaned it up just to keep the tables and it's, it's a sanitization maintenance spray. You're not actually dunking the roots or put, you're not getting any into the root zone. You're just doing a light misting for sanitation reasons. And a lot of times that's places where they've had history of, uh, you know, fusarium or pythium in their trays or irrigation system. And they've just developed some great sanitation measures. And sometimes developing that can also help the, uh, some of those accessory problems like the mold and stuff. If the rooms, if there's no mold in the room, that also helps as well. You know, finding that source of, okay, is it in the bedroom? Is it in the flower room? Where's the mold in my facility for these spores to come from? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't appear entirely out of nowhere. Although spores are ubiquitous. If we've got it's to control everywhere. the environment, it is, but if we've got a controlled environment, we should uh, be reducing some of that compared to having a trash can full of moldy bread in the room, you know? for instance. Yeah. I wonder if like a UV air purifier would, would help uh, in that kind of case too. Yeah. You know, uh, any kind of air purifier, air sanitizer, you know, even though, I'll, you know, like you said, the, those mold spores are everywhere. They're ubiquitous to our environment. Um, any effort does help. <laughs> Anytime you seal off an area and you do start cleaning the air, you know, getting to surgically clean in that room. Yeah. That might be kind of hard, but anytime we reduce spore count, um, it's better less rates of infection. I mean, that's even why we see for uh, compliance purposes and testing, you know, we don't, we don't say, oh, it can have zero bacterial fungus, fungal spores in it. No, we have a CFU count that it's allowed to uh, stay below. And that's just because we know if you go above, well, we're more likely to see problems with bacteria and mold in the product. Awesome. Thank you guys. I'm going to quickly cover our last question. Um, Jason over on YouTube wants to know, what EC do you expect to see in runoff during week four flower compared to going in? Uh, I'm seeing pH drop in one cult uh, in one cultivate one cultivar. How do you interpret a pH drop 
staying steady or rise in runoff pH? Usually uh, pH um, imbalances come from um, the nutrient composition, the way that the plant's uptaking it. Um, and so, you know, if you're seeing one cultivar uh, in an area that the pH looks good on runoff, um, no drift, and then one where it's too low, it's likely that that, that other cultivar is just, uh, just trying to indicate that it has an imbalanced nutrient pull up, um, meaning that uh, the nutrient composition of the feed is not getting eaten up in proportion for the elements in that nutrient on that cultivar. Yeah. And I mean, you know, treating that there's, there's a range of things we can do. Typically the easiest to do is uh, to start to up your EC in your feed and push a little more runoff to try to correct that imbalance. Uh, what it is really often a sign of, again, if it's drifting down your plants feeding, it's pulling those negative ion, those cations out of solution, pushing that pH down, making the solution more positive. If it's going the other way, well, <laughs> why, why are those negative ions accumulating? Why are we going the wrong direction? And Usually we do want to see a, a fairly static, if you know anything, a slight drop in pH, but not much. Great. Thank you guys for that. Uh, that was all of our questions for today. Um, yeah, we covered, uh, I feel like a record amount. I think I've said that before, but um, we got through them all today. So thank you guys. Um, any other messages you guys want to tell our audience uh, before we sign off for today? No, oh, if, uh, if you're at Hall of Flowers next week, come say hi to me. I don't know if we'll be doing office hours. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll have a chance just to highlight some of what's going on down there at that, that exhibit. And Seth can, uh, hammer out all the knowledge on his own. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. we'll have some live coverage next week, but who knows? We got a Jason, Jason's not a full news team. We don't have a van to send for him. So <laughs> we'll see what who happens. Knows? We'll have, who knows? We'll have we Keisha. Have yeah. She's, she, she knows a little bit she's more about solid. that than we do there we go who knows you guys are going to have to log in and see um with that i'm going to go ahead and sign us off so jason and seth thank you so much for another great conversation it's always a pleasure to learn from you guys and thank everyone for joining us this week uh on arroyo office hours uh thank you guys giving us some shout outs um we do this every thursday uh this is the best way to get answers uh from our experts is to join us live so go ahead and sign on with us uh if you have questions about arroya we do recommend that you book a demo with our experts they can tell you all about how it can improve your cultivation process and all of the ways that we can help you grow as always if you have a topic that you'd like us covering on office hours please do chat us shoot us an email at support.arroya at metergroup.com or send us an instagram dm we'd love to hear from you we record every session and we'll be emailing everyone in attendance a link from the video from today's discussion it'll always live forever over on our youtube channel so like and subscribe while you're there if you find these conversations helpful please feel free to share with your network and spread the word we'll see you guys next time thank you so much